Well, good morning, church. Are you thankful for the goodness of God this morning? I uh, trust that you are. Sheila and I have had the opportunity to get away for a few days this week, and uh, we have been out at Bethany Camp, and we met with some pastors and wives on uh, Monday and Tuesday, had a tremendous time of uh, retreat and refreshment uh, with them and challenge as well as we were into God's Word and uh, just hearing what God is doing around uh, our state, especially in the western part and some of the small rural areas and even some of the small towns where uh, these churches are located and these pastors are serving God faithfully in the midst of this pandemic. But we certainly all agree that we're thankful for the goodness of God. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning as we move forward. I ask you to continue to pray for uh, our Thanksgiving month that we would focus our time on Thanksgiving as we talked about last week. And that's where the focus of our prayer should be. That's where the focus of our spirit, our attitude should be on giving thanks because God is good all the time. And we, as uh, I'm hearing you respond <laughs> through uh, your computer all the time, God is good. Well, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles this morning and open them up to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And we're going to spend a few minutes uh, kind of working our way through that chapter this morning. I'm going to begin in 1 Chronicles 10 to give us some background, but we're quickly going to move in to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. But I want to tell you a little story about a gentleman who uh, went bear hunting one cold winter day. And uh, it was frigid. And he's out in the woods and uh, looking for his prey. And lo and behold, he comes along, uh, uh, upon a big bear who was out uh, foraging for some food. And the bear was hungry. And uh, as the hunter drew his gun on the bear, the bear noticed him. And he put his hands up. And he said, wait a minute, I'll stop. What are you doing? And uh, why, are, why do you want to uh, shoot me? And the hunter said, well, I'm cold and I, I need a coat and a nice fur coat would be terrific. And uh, the bear said, well, you know, uh, I'm hungry too, but uh, maybe we can get together and kind of talk about this. So there was a log there, a fallen tree. They went over and they sat down on the tree for a while and they began to discuss their various needs. And it didn't take long. And... Uh, in the end, the hunter was well enveloped in the bear's fur, and the bear had had its dinner. Well, there are times in our lives when we live so close to danger that we don't see the consequences of our actions. When the people of Israel went into the promised land, God had given them some instructions. He told them they were to eradicate the pagan influences that were in that country and to move them out, and then they were to occupy the land that God had given them. Well, as we know from history, they did not do that. One of the groups of people that remained in the land were the Philistines. And they were a very contentious people, especially when it came to relationship with the Israelites. And so there became some very difficult times. They had pagan gods, and the Israelites were rubbing shoulders with these people. They were living proximity, in proximity to all of these negative forces that God had told them to get away from and to get rid of. And so in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, we find out what happened to the Israelites because they did not get rid of these pagan gods. They lived in danger. They lived so close to this danger that it consumed them eventually. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, here's what we read. It says, the Philistines fought against Israel. And Israel's men fled from them. Many were killed on Mount Geboah. The Philistines pursued Saul, Saul was king at the time, and his sons, and killed the sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malshishua. 
When the battle intensified against Saul, the archer spotted him and severely wounded him. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through with it, or these uncircumcised men will come and torture me. But his armor bearer would not do it because he was terrified. Then Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died. And so Saul and his three sons died, and his whole house died together. When all the men of Israel in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. So the Philistines came and settled in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons dead on Mount Geboa. They stripped Saul, cut off his head, took his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to spread the good news of their or to their idols and the people. Then they put his armor in the temple and their gods of their gods and hung his skull in the temple of Dagon. That was their main god, main god of the Philistines. Well, <clears throat> you know what I'm going to say next, don't you? If you sit close, too close to the bear, you're going to get eaten. <laughs> or maybe another way to put it is if you play with fire, you're going to get burnt. <laughs> Which reminds me of another story. When we were youth leaders, we used to take our youth group on these all-nighters. And we had one that was this time of the year, actually. It was in November, and we used to go to what we called our recreation center, which was out near the airport on top of the hill on East Main Road. We had several acres of land there. Had a nice building, but we had several acres in which the kids could run and play games, and we would go out there, and we would play steal the flag, and we had big bonfires, and just a great time with the students. And one particular time, again, it was cold, it was November, I think we were celebrating Thanksgiving, and we had a big bonfire out there, and we were singing songs, sharing testimonies, and the kids were cold, and of course they're getting closer and closer to the fire. And one particular student had this brand new Nike jacket. It was a nylon jacket that was insulated, and as he got colder and colder, he got closer and closer to the fire. And he had turned around to warm his back and was so close to the fire that it melted his jacket. I was standing not too far from him, and when he turned around again and backed his self towards me, turned his back towards me, I could see the the uh, nylon was just melting. It was just dripping off of that coat, and all that was left was the insulation sticking out. And uh, we had to explain that to his parents. It was a new coat he had just gotten for winter. But he got too close to the fire. There's a real risk when we begin to get so close to sinful, ungodly cultures that we're going to get burnt. That's what happened with the Israelites when they got too close to the Philistines, that's what's happened to the student when his jacket got burned. The truth is there are too many who claim to be Christians but who want to live in a world that is not godly with the thought that I won't get burnt. But reality says much different. I'm reminded in Matthew 14 when Peter got out of the boat and walked on water, he was doing fine until what? He took his eyes off of Jesus. Then he began to drown. And I think when you take your eyes off of Jesus, you're going to drown in the wake of your own choices. And that's what happened to Israel. Well, after the death of Saul, David became king of the land. He was king of the people. He was one of the people's men. They loved David. They respected him. But more than that, David loved God. And the first thing that David did when he took the kingship of the nation of Israel was to bring a redirection of the people away from the ungodliness and away from the Philistine practices and their gods. And he wanted to turn them back to their God, Jehovah. And we see what he did 
to encourage this redirection in the book of First Chronicles chapter 16. We see David bringing the focus of these dysfunctional people back to the Lord, and he did this by bringing them to a place of thanksgiving. The things we have been talking about over this month. There are 43 verses in this chapter, and they tell an incredible story. They tell the story of the redirection that David initiated, and obviously we don't have time to read all of these verses this morning, but I would encourage you sometime in the next day or two to take your Bibles and go to 1 Chronicles 16 and read the entire chapter. But we're going to begin this morning looking at the first four verses, and I'm going to kind of highlight verses throughout the chapter, and then I'm going to give you four things that Paul or Saul did to redirect the people back to a place of thanksgiving. And so here we go. We're going to begin in verse 1 and read the first four verses. It says, they brought the ark of God and placed it inside the tent David had pitched for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings in God's presence. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people but notice how he blessed them in the name of the Lord. Right there, it shows that David is kind of redirecting the spirit of the people back to the place where it should be. Then he distributed to each and every Israelite. You see, all the people were there. That's important to know. Each and every Israelite, both men and women, a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake. And David, verse 4, appointed some of the Levites to be ministers before the ark of the Lord to celebrate the Lord God of Israel and, look at the end of verse 4, to give thanks and praise him. This hadn't happened in a long time. They had been distracted. They got too close to the fire and they had gotten burned and now David is redirecting them back to the reality that what they have, even this raisin cake and date cake, is a blessing from God. And they are to give thanks and praise to God. While we go on, I want to skip down a few verses to verses 7 and 8, where it says, On that day, David decreed for the first time, it's the first time in a long time, that thanks be given to the Lord by Asaph and his relatives. They were the worship leaders, if you will. In verse 8, he says, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among the people. And then I want to skip down a little further to verse 34. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. In verse four or 36, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Blessed. Give thanks to God from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen. And praise the Lord. Verse 41. Would them were he man and Jethunan and the rest who were chosen and designated by name to give thanks to the Lord. For his faithful love endures forever. And verse 43, then all the people, they all went home after giving thanks. And David returned home to bless his household. That idea of blessing wasn't simply to wish well upon them, but it's to give thanks to God for all he has done and point them in the direction that God is the one who's worthy of our praise and our thanks. Now, I think that David's goal here was to put the relationship of the people of Israel in its rightful place. After all the Lord had done for them, even in spite of the fact that they got too close to the fire and they got burned, they reaped the consequences of their action, the Lord was still there for them and he was still worthy of their thanks. In fact, he deserved their thanksgiving for all he had done in spite, and I think we need to remember that, in spite of their reactions, in spite of some of the choices that they made. And isn't that the way it is with us today? We really need to give thanks to God for where we are today. 
Some of the choices we've made maybe have not been the best, but yet God still loves us. He's still there. He's still providing for us. He's still looking after us and out for us, and he certainly deserves our thanks. Well, here are the four things that David did. The first thing that I notice is that David directed them to public praise. He directed them to public praise, and we saw that in those first few verses. There's something about coming together in worship that brings a level of enthusiasm that is generally not experienced when we're worshiping alone. And I don't want to give you the idea that it's not a good idea to worship alone, because I believe it is. I think there's a place for solitude. The psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. And we need to have those times when we're away from the crowd and away from others and we can focus on the Lord and bow before him and worship him and lift up his name in praise. And we can take that all in, just me and God. I think that's a great idea. But I think there's also a great benefit in corporate worship. Corporate worship has the opportunity to deliver a message of praise and thanksgiving and sometimes challenge to the masses. Corporate worship magnifies the message because it reaches so many hearts and minds and you get the corporate amen, you get the corporate praise the Lord, you get the corporate preach it, you get the corporate response, the emotion <coughs> that comes together only when you can have a group of people. It's exciting when you're with a group of people and God is at work and you can just sense the Holy Spirit moving in the hearts and minds of others. And then it reaches into your heart and mind as well. Now, in these days of pandemic, we're worshiping a little bit different. We've, out of necessity, kind of foregone some of our in-person meetings, some of our mass gatherings. And we're gathering around our televisions. We're gathering with our families, our spouses, a friend. And we don't have that same sense I think we need to be careful that we don't lose the connection with one another even when we're apart. We need to realize that there are others who are gathering right now on Facebook and worshiping with us, right along with us. And I trust that they're saying amen, and I trust that they're open to what the Holy Spirit might be doing, even through this message today, directing us to a time of praise together. And that's why I encourage you to join us on Google Meets to come alongside of us and get the little pictures on the screen of one another to know that we are all in this together and that God is working in all of our lives regardless of where we're at right now in our current COVID crisis. Well, David directed them to public praise, and I think we need to keep our eyes focused on that. Whether we're isolated or whether we're not, that we are in this together. And we can gather around the throne of grace. We can give thanks to the, the Lord <clears throat> separately together. And we need to do that. And we need to be praying that there will be a day in the not too distant future when we can gather together in a mass group and praise the Lord like Israel did. Well, <clears throat> David directed them to public praise. The second thing that David did was he encouraged them in personal participation. David blessed the people, verse 2, each and every Israelite, verse 3, and verse 36, all the people said amen, and in verse 43, all the people went home. Just directing our thoughts to the idea that there were masses and masses of people there, but they all took part in what was going on. They were all a part of participating in that. And again, I say, even though we might be gathering on Facebook today, you need to participate <clears throat> in what's going on. You need to open God's word yourself and read it yourself and participate in what's going on to direct your heart, your mind, and your attention to the things of God. And to be an encouragement to others, though, you might not even see them at this point. You can be prayerfully considering them and participate personally and what's going on. This might not seem like a major thing, but I think it was huge. I think it was huge because the people had been playing with fire. The people 
And so now to bring the people together, I think, was an important thing. It was a time for Israel's people to engage in this time of praise and thanks to God as a group to encourage one another. Now, I've been encouraged by the many words of thanksgiving that I've been receiving day in and day out. And I know this week's been an odd week. We've been having some technical issues uh, out here in uh, Bethany. And uh, I haven't been able to get all my emails out or receive all of them. We're, we've been working on it through the week. So I hope by now you're getting more of that. And I'm receiving more of those thanks from you as well. But I know they have been a blessing to me. And I've heard from many others how thankful they are to hear of your thanks and your participation in this idea of sharing our thankfulness. In the process that David had going on, engaging these people in God's blessing in their life, it brought joy to their souls. You know, you hear the commercial, and I'm not a, a lottery guy, never bought a lottery ticket, but they say that you can't win if you don't play. And I think the idea kind of bridges our gap here in our relationship with God. You're not going to win if you don't participate in opportunities to praise God, to give thanks, and to worship. You're going to forfeit the joy of the Lord in so many ways, whether you're doing it alone or whether you're doing it in a group. If you don't play, you can't, or if you don't, yeah, you can't win if you don't play. And uh, you're not going to get those benefits of the participation if you don't involve yourself personally. Here's the third thing. David reminds them of God's work in the past. And I think this is one of the great things of Thanksgiving that we can do to think back of this last year. What has God done in our life during the last 11 months? Now we know we're about the last eight or nine months We've been experiencing this isolation, this separation, and everything that goes along with it. But you know, there are still things to praise God for in that. I praise God, again, for technology that we have the opportunities like we're doing right now just to share God's word in this time with one another. I thank God that during this time, personally, I've had the opportunity to go back through the scriptures and look up studies and on things like hope and joy and thanksgiving. And so God is at work, and he's worked in the past, and he will continue to work in the future because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. <coughs> well, David reminded them of God's work in the past, and I want to go to verse 12 here in this chapter. It says, remember the wondrous works he has done, his wonders and the judgments that he has pronounced. Your offspring of Israel, his servant, Jacob's descendants, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments govern the whole earth. Remember his covenant forever. The promise he ordained for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. He swore to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a decree, and to Israel as a permanent covenant. I will give you the land of Canaan. I will give the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portions. You see, God's work in the past is a display of his power, of his presence, and his promises. David wanted to keep these things before the people. And I want to keep them before you today as well. Remember God's presence in your life at those times when you felt lonely, you felt a time of despair. Remember his power when there were things that you couldn't do and we came to a place where you had to be dependent upon God and God showed up and did a God thing. Remember his promises because it ain't over yet. And God has promised to be with us until the very end of the age. And so we need to be dependent upon those, and we need to be reminded that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as he worked in the past, he will continue to work 
in the present and in the future. I think it's good maybe to sit down with a piece of paper and think back over your life. Maybe start in the last week. What has God done in my life in the last week, in the last month, in the last year, the last five years, in the last ten years? Whatever. What has God done? We need to be reminded of those things. Here, David writes about Israel's past going all the way back to Abraham, hundreds of years. And God was faithful over all those hundreds of years. God's faithful in the few years that you've been around as well. But sometimes we don't take the time to note that. And I think today would might, might be a great time to do that. Well, here's a fourth thing. David challenged them to make a commitment to live for God in the present. We go to verse 37. So David left Asaph. Remember, he's the worship leader, and his relatives there before the ark of the Lord's covenant to minister regularly before the ark according to the daily, the daily requirements. That's the present. Living in the present. Living day to day. So David left him there, and he left him there to lead worship on a daily basis. Basis. So the people would not lose sight of the blessing and the thanks that was due to God. I think God wants us to remember his faithfulness of the past, but he wants us to live powerfully in the present. And so he reminds us in Micah 6 8 what's required of us to live thankfully in the presence of God on a daily basis. He says, Mankind, he has told each of you, and he is God, what you or what is good. And this is what the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Well, are you in a place of thanks today? Each and every day, are you acting justly? Are you loving faithfulness? And are you walking humbly with your God? David challenged the people to live every day in the presence of God. Take care of those daily requirements, and you'll experience the joy of the Lord, and you'll have more and more opportunities to give thanks. So, are you at a place of thanks today? In a nutshell, here's how you can get it. Praise God in a public forum and honor him when and where honor is due. Get involved personally in worship and serving the Lord. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. Note it. Celebrate it. And then live empowered by God's promise of faithfulness in the presence. And in all those things, you can give thanks. Well, as we close today, I'm going to play a song for you that you're familiar with. Give thanks with a grateful heart. I encourage you to sing along with it. Open up your heart to the music and the words and the message and give thanks. But before we go there, let's just pray. Father, we are thankful even in this day and age where we are socially isolated and uh, worshiping oftentimes independently of our brothers and sisters. We just ask that your spirit of unity would overwhelm us that we might enter into your presence, not only individually, but as a group corporately, in spite of separation. And God, help us to remember your faithfulness of the past. Encourage us to be faithful as we move forward. And we give you thanks for all that you have done, all that you will do, and even what you are doing in this very moment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless, and I trust you'll have a wonderful day of thanks going forward.